We have a lot to cover in today's video, including the Maple Leafs and Blues pulling off a blockbuster trade. We're going to recap that deal and take a look at some options they may have going forward. Is Patrick Kane running out of options? The Leafs and Rangers were the two teams reportedly hiding on his wish list. They've both made other moves. Plus, we're going to take a look at the latest on Timo Meyer as well. Where might he end up? Plus, we have several other uh, injury updates, roster moves, etc. as well. As a big melee in the Kings Ducks last night, we saw a goalie ejected. We'll discuss all that and more coming up next. So welcome back to another video here, Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a variety of NHL news and some trade rumors to take a look at here today. Uh, once again, there's no news from the NHL waiver wire, so nothing to report on that front. But we did have a really odd scenario last night, something that we don't really see very often. We almost had a goalie fight, and we saw a goalie... Uh, given a misconduct and ejected from the game. The game between the Los Angeles Kings and the Anaheim Ducks obviously got uh, a little chaotic at times, you could say. Uh, there was a scrum around the key crease, uh, whereas the Kings goalie, uh, Phoenix Copley, who's been phenomenal for them since he was called up earlier in the season, basically largely responsible for turning things around in LA, I think it's fair to say, ended up getting kicked out of the game uh, during a scrum in the crease. Uh, he ended up punching uh, the duck player that was on the ice in the bottom of the pile with his blocker. So blocker punches can lead to game misconduct. So we kind of call it a content to injure, basically. And uh, he was escorted from the game. Kings ended up obviously in penalty trouble. Uh, you've seen Ducks goaltender John Gibson, when he's seen all this happening at the other end of the ice, race down, stopped in center ice, and he was standing there waiting and uh, ready and willing to have a goalie fight with Copley, which is something we haven't seen uh, in quite some time. It's not very common. You don't see goalies ejected. You rarely see goalie fights. I know a lot of people were hoping it was going to happen. The officials got involved and, and stopped everything, and nothing uh, materialized from there. But Gibson was ready to roll based on what he's seen on the other end. So certainly, like I said, just a rare set of circumstances, not something you see very often. Of course, we get a variety of uh, injury updates and some roster adjustments here as well of course the Maple Leafs we'll talk about them after making a, a late blockbuster trade with the Blues late last night there is a dedicated video on the channel already analyzing that breakdown if you haven't seen it I'll put it up in the YouTube card so you can watch that separately to get the full details if you want I will touch on it here in a bit in a few moments as well but uh, for right now the Leafs had a recall on an emergency basis goalie Eric Schalgren. so of course they're going to be with him and Joseph Wall for tonight's game against the Montreal Canadiens Wall will start Schalgren will back up uh, Ely Samsonov is out tonight, uh, I believe dealing with an illness of some sort. And of course, Matt Murray was also moved to long-term injury reserve today. The ankle still has a ways to go. Sheldon Keefe updated things yesterday saying that he's, uh, you know, still not where he needs to be with the ankle. They don't have a definitive timeline. He's been out for, geez, a number of weeks now. So obviously they can put him on LTIR retroactive to when the injury began. Uh, so depending on how things go. Uh, they don't necessarily have to leave them there for, for too much longer, depending on how things heal, I guess. Um, they also had to send down Wayne Simmons and Pontus Holberg. They've been officially demoted to the American Hockey League Toronto Marlies to make room on the roster for the newly acquired players in Ryan O'Reilly and Nola Cherry, who both come over from the St. Louis Blues. Uh, obviously, you know, like I said, a late-night blockbuster deal, which we'll touch on here in the treat section of the video. Just a moment. First, I want to get through these other injuries. The roster moves. Uh, we have a bunch of recalls to look at. Montreal Canadiens have recalled defenseman Corey Schumann for tonight's game. Uh, the Vancouver Canucks have called up defenseman Christian Milana, who's been an absolute beast in the AHL for Abbotsford, having a phenomenal year down there. Hopefully, he can make the most of the NHL call up and uh, you know fulfill his potential at the NHL level. Uh, the St. Louis Blues had to recall a couple of players as well to fill the roster spots that vacated by their former teammates traded to the Leafs. They've recalled Nikita Alexandrov and Matthew Highmore. Uh, so they'll get a chance to play up with uh, the uh, roster a little thinner now after the trade. And the Dallas Stars have also recalled Frederick Olofsson. A few other injury updates uh, we already uh, discussed before. The Hams defenseman and rookie Arbor Jankai was injured. He's now officially on IR, which just means he's going to be out a little bit longer, more than just day to day. Uh, so he'll likely be out for... I would say probably another week, maybe more. We'll see. I don't know if they have further updates on, on his injury. Uh, and the, the Vancouver Canucks have also placed Travis Derwin on injury reserve. And uh, Johnny Gaudreau in Columbus is going to miss tonight's game as well. Uh, he's now listed as day-to-day -day for Columbus as well. Now, as I mentioned, we had a very uh, you know significant blockbuster trade go down 
late last night. I had already done the video for the night talking about all the news and the latest treatment words as of yesterday. Uh, I was pretty well getting close to midnight my time, I believe it was, here in the uh, Atlantic time zone and the east coast of Canada. Um, and when I seen the news from a late Friedman, it was no time at all. He started with a quick tweet saying that he believes the Blues and Leafs were working on something. And within a minute or two later, the deal was announced by the Maple Leafs and uh, the NHL Insiders were getting the full details out as well. So in case you missed it, quick recap, the, uh, the Maple Leafs, like I said earlier, acquired Noel Achari and Ryan O'Reilly from the St. Louis Blues. St. Louis retained 50% of O'Reilly's salary. Technically, there's a third team involved here with the Minnesota Wild. Uh, the Blues technically traded O'Reilly uh, to Minnesota with 50% retained. Minnesota then retained another 25% and flipped them to Toronto. Uh, Toronto gives Minnesota a fourth round pick. Uh, then, of course, uh, the Leafs also gave up a first, second, and third to the St. Louis Blues uh, in this trade. Um, they also send uh, American Honk League players Adam Gaudet and Mikhail Abramov as well. So all in all, the Leafs get a, you know, a, a guy O'Reilly who's, you know, obviously a former Conn Smythe Selkie Trophy winner, a playoff beast, uh, you know, Stanley Cup champion from a few years back in 2019. Yes, you could say he's having a down season, but a lot of the uh, advanced analytics of O'Reilly this year would say that O'Reilly has been one of the unluckiest NHL players on the season. So, you know, obviously I think playing with some higher-end talent in Toronto should very much help things turn around. Sounds like they're going to start him off as the number two center. Move John Tavares to the wing. So O'Reilly will play with Tavares and Marner to at least start. We'll see how things go. Uh, they could very well switch O'Reilly and Tavares back as well. We'll see. Uh, I mean, you know, O'Reilly and Tavares, you know, could probably swap spots if necessary. We'll see how that goes. But either way, I think the Leafs did a, a great job. And you have to wonder, though, because they still have cap space left. Getting O'Reilly as cheap as they did... Yes, they gave up a lot of picks, but they didn't give up any of their top prospects, and they didn't give up anything off their roster. So, yeah, they're down on draft currency, but as I've said before, this is a huge year for the Toronto Maple Leafs. you got the looming extensions for Austin Matthews and William Nylander. They're going to probably want big raises again. Um, you know, and that's going to be a really tough salary cap scenario for them to handle. Kyle Dubas is in the final year of his contract. He's looking to obviously have success to remain as GM of the Leafs. Uh, you know, they've gone... Was the six years in a row, I believe, uh, most of which with this core group, um, or at least largely, um, with the first round exits in the playoffs. They've been becoming a more competitive playoff team for quite some time. It's really more of an overdue here for a step forward, and they're setting themselves up to be stacked to make that happen. So, what might be coming next? Jonas Seigel, the Athletic, put an article today wondering if they might very well end on the blue line. Now that they've made that forward acquisition, they got that top six player in O'Reilly. They got a Cherry, who is a really good short-handed player, good penalty killer, um, and good, very well bottom six. Probably going to be a fourth line center, which is, I believe, where he's going to start tonight. Um, so the, the you know the forward group's pretty deep. Um, do they add in the blue line next? Is the big question. And the athletic article here from Seigel questions whether or not if they do that, that maybe would they consider trading Rasmus Sandin to make it happen? Uh, he feels that if they don't trade Sandin and they bring in another defenseman that Sandin might be the odd man out that gets bumped from the lineup. At least that's his opinion on the matter. Uh, question maybe if Jake McCabe in Chicago might be the player that they were targeting. There was some rumors before that to get McCabe at 50% salary retained in Chicago, that it was going to cost a first-round pick. They obviously couldn't do that now uh, because they've given up their first-round pick unless they trade a future year. Um, you know, that's possible, I guess. And at the same time, you know, do they maybe go – a different route with uh, maybe a second round pick and a prospect or would the Blackhawks actually consider accepting a, you know, young defenseman like Sandine who could be a, a help right away. I mean, he would certainly bump himself up in the lineup for sure and get a bigger role there. Um, and if it's not Jake McCabe, it really boils down to who the trading team would be and where they're picking the next guy up if they do that. But, you know, rumor has it that they would like to add on the blue line now that the forward group is looked after and ideally somebody who can play you know, preferably top four minutes, but the Burley's top six at a physical edge maybe to be something close to a Jake Muzzin replacement because it's not expected that he return this year. So we'll see where that goes. But the Leafs likely are not done, and adding on the blue line most likely is what comes next. It just really boils down to who they get and what kind of price tag they have to pay. But where they've already moved a lot of picks, 
They don't really want to move, preferably one of these top prospects like a Matthew Nyes or Nick Robertson. Would they consider a Sandine trade? I'm not so sure that they would. I think they're going to really load up here, so I'd be surprised if they want to take much of anything off the roster, but um, they could be forced here to make a move. I would think a guy like Justin Hall might be more likely to get moved, but we will see where all that goes. I'd like to know your thoughts on this article. Do you think the Leafs would consider that if it means bringing in a you know, more physical defenseman that might be a little bit more costly? I don't know. I'm not so sure they should do that. You got to think about now and winning, but you got to think about the future too. Now, with Patrick Kane, let's talk about him next. I mean, Patrick Kane had a great game last night against the Ottawa Senators, scoring a couple of key goals, including the game tying goal late in the game. Showed that he very much still has it and can still play and contribute. The main two teams that's been mentioned in Kane's wish list to be traded to if he decides to waive his no trade clause was the New York Rangers and Toronto Maple Leafs. But we've seen both teams now make blockbuster deals with other teams, which pretty much take them out of the Patrick Kane sweepstakes should he decide he wants to go there. So the next focus here would be, you know, potentially the Dallas Stars or a team that's been mentioned. But I can say with certainty, based on other reports, and we talked about this a little while back as well, because I know one of the Sportsnet writers, Mark Spector, is convinced that the Oilers and Blancocks have had conversations and that they might have kind of like a handshake agreement that are, like, they might be willing to revisit here. And obviously, it's all in Kane's court. We know that Patrick Kane will call the shots here because he has a full no move clause. So if he doesn't want to go somewhere, he won't. It's just that simple. It's up to him, really, at the end of the day and his decision. But the uh, the rumor here is kind of fueled further by Chris Johnston putting on his latest show of the CJ show on uh, on his podcast, talking about how he said he has sources confirming that the Oilers definitely have reached out to the Blackhawks to confirm that they have interest in Patrick Kane and to kind of get some feelers out there to see if he would be willing to reach to remove the moon or waste or the no move clause to go to Edmonton. Now, like I said, Mark Spector of Sportsnet thinks things went a little further and that they've even discussed framework of a potential deal. Essentially, how that was rumored to be, you know, uh, looking at was that Jesse Pogliarvi and Warren Fogel would both go to Chicago to free up the money. Uh, the Chicago Blackhawks would retain 50%, and then the Oilers, of course, would, uh, like I said, they put in Pogliarvi and Fogel to make the money work, and he would also receive likely a first-round pick and a prospect to make the, you know, for Kane's services, essentially, with half of his salary retained. The money would work because Kane at 50% would be like $5.25 million. Pugliarvi and Fogel make enough money going out to cover that, so it would be money in, money out. And then, of course, the Hawks get a couple of other assets for their efforts in training Kane. So it very well could happen. Now, Chris Johnson reports, not only has Edmonton inquired, but he says that Patrick Kane, at the very least, it was told, that his interests were peaked. So he's not saying that Kane would definitely go to Edmonton, but you're getting to think that the thought of playing with some elite talent like McDavid, like Drysdale, Nugent Hopkins, you know, etc., that that sounds like a fun possibility for him and a team that he could gel well with and, uh, you know, go on a good run. So Patrick Kane to Edmonton might be one of his last options considering his, you know, wish list. Is kind of scratched off at this point with the Rangers at least pretty much out of the sweepstakes. Now, couldn't they both technically fit him under the cap with a third-party brokering and deal? It's still remotely possible, but does it make sense after acquiring other forwards? I don't think it does. You guess crazier things have happened. I just don't see it anymore. It doesn't make sense for those teams to also want to add Patrick Kane on top of what they've already added. So could the Edmonton deal... Come back here, and could that be where he ends up? That's ultimately up to him, but I'd like to know what you guys think down in the comments. With Timo Meyer, of course, you know, some of these teams that have been already making big deals, like Toronto, have been rumored to be in the Timo Meyer uh, business as well of having interest, and you can pretty much eliminate them now from that equality of the equation as well. So that kind of leaves New Jersey and Carolina. I mean, the main two teams that have been rumored to want to acquire Timo Meyer from the San Jose Sharks. Now, given the quality of player Timo Meyer is, I'm sure there are other teams out there with interest. I would think a big chunk of the league would have interest. He's young, he's an RFA, and he's a one heck of a hockey player who can be a power forward goal scoring threat. So to me, a lot of teams would probably love to have Timo Meyer. I have no doubt other teams are at least kicking tires and you know getting some general inquiries out there on this player. These two teams seem to be the most serious from what we've heard in a rumor mill that want to get this done ahead of the playoffs. Now, Carolinas believe that, 
They might have to give up a player like Seth Jarvis to make this work, and I don't know that they're really going to want to do that. The other downfall in Carolina is I don't know that they can commit to him making 9 or $10 million long term. Uh, they may or may not want to do that. They've been kind of shying away from a lot of these bigger contracts. If they value him that much and they want to offer him that, maybe it works out. But it's also been rumored that he would likely agree to sign long term in New Jersey, given the fact that uh, he is friend and fellow country and Niku Hishi, of course, is on the team, and that he that would be a team he would be interested in and working with on a longer term basis. So I honestly think the Devils might have a better chance at signing him long term. They do have a lot of draft currency and interesting prospects that I think would very much intrigue the San Jose Sharks. Uh, it's just going to be a little bit of a challenge from a cap perspective for them to add Timo Meyer and signing him at, you know, nine, nine point five, ten million dollars $10 million. So it's going to be very, very interesting. But some of these teams are certainly eliminating themselves from that process as well. And we'll see how this impacts things and, what ends up with Meyer? I mean, the, the Sharks are in a spot with Meyer. They're not forced to trade him before the deadline. He's not the UFA. He's an RFA. If they don't get the deals that they want, they very well could hang on to him, and he could end up being one of the big names treated at this year's NHL draft. That would not be shocking at all. Teams have more flexibility. It might increase their offers at that point. So we'll have to wait and see. But let me know your thoughts on all of today's news or rumors down in the comments, and we'll discuss further. If you're new to this channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with all the latest news, rumors, and analysis of all 32 NHL teams. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time. <laughs>